Hi, everybody. Welcome to the UCLA Behavior Evolution and Culture Speaker Series. I'm Clark Barrett. I'm running the speaker series this year. Our series is actually drawing to a close. Our 2020-2021 um, speaker series is drawing to a close. Um, the talk um, that you're about to see is the penul penultimate talk of the year. And uh, we have one more talk next week. Let me just give you a preview of that. So next week, we're going to have Professor Alyssa Crittenden from uh, UNLV, Department of Anthropology. And her talk is called Microbiomania, Rewilding, and the Threat of Bioprospecting, How Anthropologists Can Help to Set a More Ethical Research Agenda in Microbiome Sciences. Um, so that promises to be a really interesting talk. Um, so please join us for that. This week, today, it is my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Chris Krupenye, who is visiting us uh, from Durham University in England. Thank you for zooming in um, with the time difference and all. We're looking forward to your talk. And so Chris is actually uh, right now at Durham, but he will be beginning a tenure track position at Johns Hopkins University uh, in 20, is it going to be 2022 that you're starting? Yeah. That's right. Um, so congrats on that position. And we're looking forward to having you back in the States. Um, so today, let me just, um, so Chris's talk is called The Social Minds of Humans and Other Apes. Whenever you're ready, Chris, go ahead and share your slides. And um, others, if you would like to briefly unmute yourself, please join me in welcoming Dr. Chris Krupenye. Thanks so much, Clark. Um, yeah. Let me just sure. share my screen. Um, okay. Perfect. Right, yeah. Thank you so much for the kind of introduction and hello everyone. Uh, I'd also like to start by thanking both Clark and Erica Cartmel for the kind um, in, invitation to speak um, and to all of you for joining me. It's a great pleasure to be with you today um, and to have the opportunity to share my work. As Clark said, I'll be speaking about the social minds of humans and other apes. All right, so let's start with some facial expressions that no one is hoping to see today. <laughs> okay, so actually I'm showing you this photo because I think it highlights something fascinating about humans. It's a static image and yet we're immediately drawn in and we can barely help extracting all sorts of social information. Information about cultural context or group membership, information about social relationships. You may be imagining what these people are looking at and you may even feel something in response to their emotional expressions. This is all central to what it means to be human. We're a deeply social species and we possess rich cognitive capacities for navigating a complex social world. And indeed, social cognition is at the heart of much of what makes our species unique. We cooperate and compete on unprecedented scales and in unique and flexible ways. We're political and moral, we display forms of communication not seen in any other species, and we're deeply cultural, exhibiting rich cultures comprised both of universally common elements as well as vast behavioral diversity. And each of these distinctly human traits is shaped by our social cognition, the ways we uh, cooperate, com compete, communicate, and learn all depend on rich knowledge of our social partners and the broader social world. We take into account things like the perspectives and goals of our allies and opponents, our teachers and our pupils. And we go further, even attempting to account for our social partners' knowledge and evaluations of us. As a result of this great complexity, human social life is replete with challenges. How do we come to learn the norms of our group? How do we manage our relationships and our reputation? How do we decide with whom we should ally ourselves or from whom we should learn? How do we anticipate others' behavior for effective coordination or competition when the social world is inherently dynamic and awash with uncertainty? 
These are the sorts of questions that animate my research, and they can be subsumed into two even broader questions at the interface of cognitive science and anthropology. First, how do we represent and navigate the social world? How do we parse the social world into intelligible units of information? And what sorts of social knowledge do we catalog and deploy to predict others' behavior and make strategic decisions? That is, at the proximate level, what cognitive mechanisms support human social behavior? And second, at the ultimate level, how did these mechanisms evolve? Before I go further, and because there are huge debates about terminology, I want to offer a few definitions. When I say cognition, I'm referring generally to all of the mechanisms by which animals acquire, process, store, and act on information from the environment. <clears throat> Social cognition uh, refers to all such mechanisms that pertain to social information or the social world, whether those mechanisms are domain specific or domain general. And finally, I take cognitive representations um, to be information about the environment encoded, computed, or stored in some way by the brain, permitting further processes like computation, combination, prediction, and decision making. So, how did human social cognition evolve? Uh, one prominent possibility was put forward by Nicholas Humphrey in 1978, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. He argued that social cognition evolved through adaptation to the challenges of living in a group. Social animals must compete with group mates for reproductive opportunities, meaning that there's a clear fitness benefit for the socially adept if they're able to successfully build relationships and outcompete their group mates. If improvements to social cognition allow their bearers to better thrive and reproduce, these cognitive adaptations will, prolif will proliferate in the population. And in a ratcheting effect, across generations, the elaboration of social cognition will elevate the complexity of the social world, since animals must now contend with ever more clever group mates, thus creating new challenges that further select for other social cognitive adaptations. In this view, social complexity is intimately linked to social cognition and cannot be understood in its absence. My goal today will be to examine some of the cognitive traits that I believe have most profoundly elaborated the complexity of social life and how they may have evolved. To do this, I'll first take a phylogenetic perspective, asking how did our ancestors see the social world? What cognitive abilities preceded the evolution of our species and the evolution of language? What might social complexity have meant subjectively to these ancestors? Second, I'll briefly take um, a functional perspective, examining one adaptationist hypothesis about the origins of social cognition. In doing so, this dual approach aims to understand what it means to be human and how we came to be. So beginning with our first aim, um, the understanding how our ancestors see the social world. Because cognition does not fossilize, the most powerful window we have into the minds of our ancestors is through comparisons between humans and the other living apes. Although extant apes have been evolving independently just as long as we have and are not exactly time capsules to our common ancestor, Traits that we share with them were most likely present in our Miocene common ancestors, while those only found in humans likely evolved uniquely in our lineage since its divergence from the other apes. It's these unique traits that must be responsible for the leaps in social and cultural complexity that humans experienced in the last six to nine million years. Now, before I go further, I want to highlight that other apes also live rich and dynamic social lives. They must navigate the sorts of social demands that could select for the evolution of social intelligence. Our very closest relatives in particular, bonobos and chimpanzees live in large multi-male, multi-female societies that are characterized by promiscuous mating, coalitionary aggression, and fission-fusion dynamics. This means that they're familiar with um, large groups, sometimes up to 200 individuals, 
uh, who live in their community, but generally they range in smaller fluid parties that, that change in composition throughout the day. Critically, these species differ in fundamental ways, especially with chimpanzees exhibiting male dominance, territory uh, border patrols, and lethal intergroup uh, aggression. And bonobos exhibiting female co-dominance and relatively positive relations between groups. These differences demand that we study both species to understand the origins of our own. Now, I'd like to take this opportunity to show you just one quick and cheeky example of a chimpanzee being apparently very clever. Make sure to read the subtitles. So here we have this fascinating instance of uh, mother of the year apparently deceiving her son, a behavior that could reflect really rich intentional manipulation and perspective taking, but it could also be a strategy that she learned accidentally over time, or it may even be that she didn't plan to steal the tool at all and only recognize the opportunity once it arose while her son was grooming her. These kinds of observations suggest that animals could be doing things very, that are very clever. Um, sometimes uh, some things that may have adaptive benefits in natural settings and that may have rich cognitive underpinnings. But um, we need controlled experiments to rule out different explanations and identify the causal, in this case, cognitive mechanisms that underlie that behavior. Accordingly, most of the work I'll present involves controlled experiments with captive primates. Okay, so as I mentioned before, in the first half of the talk, I'll examine some of the cognitive traits that have elevated the computational complexity of the social world. There are a huge range of cognitive and motivational traits that may come into play. Um, some data, for example, suggests that apes are not just aggressive competitors, but may share some basic motivations to cooperate or to help others. They share foundational biases in decision-making, and they may even have some capacity to plan for the future. However, for today's purposes, I want to focus on two strictly social domains of cognition that I believe have played the greatest role in elaborating the complexity of social life throughout primate evolutionary history. The first domain is social knowledge. In essence, this is how much primates know about one another. Take, for example, this social field. Can animals recognize individuals, remember their past interactions with them? Can they track those individuals' relationships with one another? And can they evaluate others on the basis of social norms and markers of group membership? As you can clearly see, with each stage, the world becomes ever more complex and computationally demanding. There's more social information to potentially keep in mind, and you have to contend with group mates doing their best to catalog just as much information. A key question is where apes fall on this continuum of social complexity. I'll share two experiments that start to get at that question. The ability to recognize individuals is widespread among animals, but in species where many individuals disperse, and intergroup interactions happen periodically, there's also great value in long-term memory of familiar individuals. To determine whether apes share this capacity, my first PhD student mentee, Laura Lewis, who's pictured here, performed an eye-tracking experiment with chimpanzees and bonobos across several zoos. Eye-tracking eye is a crucial tool in human psychology, 
but it's been uh, rather challenging to develop non-invasive restraint-free methods for animals. Only recently have we overcome these challenges um, through collaborations um, with my colleague Fumihiro Kano. As you can see in the photo of our setup at Edinburgh Zoo, apes can choose to enter the testing space and drink juice. And this basically encourages them to volunteer to situate themselves in exactly the location we need them to be in um, for an eye tracker to be able to um, identify their, their gaze um, and record um, their attention and pupil dilation while we present to them various videos and images on the monitor. In this experiment, uh, which involved a fairly simple design, apes viewed side-by-side -side images of members of their species. Both images were of the same sex, but one individual was completely unfamiliar and the other was a former groupmate, an individual who had either died or been transferred to another zoo. So one of these individuals is someone familiar to the apes, um, but that they haven't seen uh, potentially in many years. Um, and with the time since uh, their last interaction varying from roughly a year to um, over a decade or multiple decades before. If apes can remember these past groupmates, we predicted that they would show a bias to look more at the former groupmate over the unfamiliar individual. And this is exactly what we found in both chimpanzees and bonobos. You can see here the looking bias um, represented on the y-axis with higher values reflecting more looking to the former groupmate. Interestingly, the duration apart did not influence the strength of the looking bias. Um, and I wanna show you one particularly exciting data point. This is Louise and Loretta. Um, Loretta is down the road from you at the San Diego Zoo. Um, and Louise is now in Kumamoto Sanctuary in Japan. We collected these data in 2019 and these bonobos last saw each other in 1992. These apes seem to remember each other in some form for at least 25 or 30 years. And keep in mind that many apes only live into their 30s or 40s or 50s. While there's much work to be done to characterize the nature of this memory, our findings suggest that ape social lives are not confined entirely to the present <clears throat> and that they're able to track individuals with whom they have a personal relationship across a majority of their lifespan. Critically, this capacity to track individuals over distant space and time was likely already present in our ancestors as they engaged in increasingly complex and temporally disparate interactions with members of other social groups. Next, we wanted to ask how richly apes are tracking other social dynamics. Foundational abilities for tracking social information and evaluate, uh, evaluating others based on that information emerge early in human ontogeny. Young infants are <clears throat> sorry, sensitive to myriad features of the social environment, such as others' pro-social and antisocial behavior and dominance relations. Strikingly, by three months of age, North American infants can discriminate helpers from hinderers in third-party interactions and show a preference for helpers. As they grow, children's capacity to evaluate others becomes more specific and complex. Investigating discrimination of helpers from hinderers in third-party contexts provided an opportunity to see whether apes can track third-party information and quickly evaluate others on the basis of that information, and also to see potentially whether their evaluations might be based on anything like the kinds of social norms we often see in humans. So Brian Hare and I looked at this question in Bonobos, the arguably more tolerant of our two closest relatives. In the seminal infant studies, babies witness displays in which, sorry, um, in which uh, shapes or puppets helped or hindered one another. Sorry. Um, 
Shit, yeah, sorry. The um, <clears throat> helped or hindered one another, then the infants could. Um, uh, so here you see a helping event, and then the infants could uh, reach for. Uh, so that was a helper, and here's a hinder. Um, then the. Uh, oh, okay. Sorry, I got a bit um, lost. Um, so infants are, are looking at these kinds of puppet shows where you see helpers or hinders interacting, and then they can choose uh, either the helper or the hinder. And in a series of four studies, we asked whether bonobos could also track the behavior of novel agents in these kinds of third-party interactions and make sensible social decisions on the basis of this information. To document the consistency of bonobo social evaluations, we tested them across several related paradigms. In the first study, um, they saw these kinds of animations that I just showed you on an iPad just outside of their enclosure. So here you can see this helping event where this helper arrives um, and helps the climber to climb the hill. Um, there's also a hinderer event um, where an agent blocks the climber's attempts as well as some additional control stimuli. Um, so the bonobos watch these events. And then as you can see here, they could choose between paper cutouts of the helper or the hinderer. In the next two studies, um, outside of their enclosures, bonobos instead watch interactions between unfamiliar human actors attempting to help or hinder a third party, a third individual who dropped a toy out of reach. Bonobos could then take food from either the helper or the hinderer. Excitingly, across all three studies, adult bonobos reliably tracked agents' behavior and showed robust preferences um, and no preferences in various controls. But unlike humans, um, they just like the jerks. So we find across these studies that adult bonobos are consistently showing a preference for hinderers over helpers. Um, Okay, so we find consistent evidence that bonobos are encoding something about others' behavior and making social decisions uh, on the basis of that third-party information. But we still wanted to get to the bottom of their preference for jerks. We wondered whether bonobos preferred the hinderers because they saw them as dominant, since the hinderers always won out and thwarted others' goals. An attraction to dominant potential allies would be sensible since for most social species, dominance is a powerful determinant of access to resources like food and mates. So we tested this hypothesis directly in a fourth study. On an iPad again, bonobos watched animations of dominance interactions and then chose between paper cutouts of the dominant and subordinate agents. As we expected, bonobos showed a significant, though not overwhelming, preference for the dominant agent. So aligning with some work in other apes and monkeys, across all four studies, bonobos discriminated actors based on their behavior toward third parties. And interestingly, they did so even with animated agents, suggesting that like humans, they may have a deep and flexible system for agency detection. And importantly, they were able to make sensible social decisions on the basis of this third party knowledge. So we have, I think, strong evidence to say that bonobos are able to keep track of third party information. However, unlike humans, bonobos reliably preferred antisocial individuals, perhaps because they saw them as dominant. These findings align with affinities for dominant potential allies that have been observed in the wild, so these decisions are sensible and potentially adaptive in bonobo society, but they raise the possibility that a more complex tendency to evaluate others based on things like cooperative norms may not be present in our closest relatives. That said, I think much more work is necessary to confirm such a conclusion. For me, the major takeaway from these studies is that for bonobos and likely our common ancestor six to nine million years ago, the social world is hugely complex. Apes are closely tracking third-party interactions in order to make adaptive, potentially political decisions. 
and they must contend with friends and competitors who are doing the same. So they've already got a lot on their plate, but as I alluded to earlier, there's also another domain of social cognition that might further elaborate the complexity that they face from the social environment. This final, and I think most influential domain is called theory of mind. Theory of mind allows animals to track not only others' behavior and social relationships, but to infer what others are, others are thinking, their goals, perceptions, and beliefs. It's the ability that humans use all the time to make inferences or theorize about what's going on in others' minds. Theory of mind is closely tied to our experience of social complexity because it's central to our ability to interpret, predict, and even manipulate each other's behavior. And we may spend quite a lot of effort and sometimes anxiety trying to figure out what others are thinking. Within theory of mind, there are also a few levels of complexity. Um, and I'll just discuss two of them. A simpler conception of others' minds would allow me to track what others can see and what they have seen or know about. In the example depicted here, based on an observation by Hans Kummer, the individual on the right might recognize that the large male on the left cannot see behind the rock. In this case, uh, the individual on the right would represent one single view of the world and recognize which parts of it others have access to. This is already remarkable, but what humans do is even more complex. If that individual on the right has a human-like theory of mind, he may instead recognize that the large male believes falsely or incorrectly that there is nothing behind the rock, even though he knows that there is something there. The fundamental difference is that this animal is now able to think about two entirely distinct views of the world, his own and the conflicting view of another. As you can imagine, richer conceptions of others' minds permit more adept deception and coordination, and thus have greatly impacted the complexity of human and primate social life. And indeed, theory of mind, and particularly this false belief understanding, is really at the heart of much of what's unique about our species. We consider others' knowledge and beliefs when we communicate or teach, or when we attempt to co cooperate or deceive. We even delineate cultural group membership on the basis of shared and differing beliefs. For this reason, the prevailing notion for decades was that some component of theory of mind is unique to humans and that its absence in apes can explain the apparent gulf in social complexity between our species and theirs. Experimental research over the last 40 years suggests that apes are sensitive in some sense to others' goals and to what others can see or know, but that they may not grasp what others believe. In this next work that I'll present to you, my colleagues, especially Fumihiro Kano, and I wanted to know whether it's really true that apes cannot track others' beliefs in any form. We wondered whether comparative cognition was being held back by a lack of adequate methodologies and whether new eye tracking procedures um, that were making discoveries with, uh, with human infants could change our understanding of animal theory of mind. Most studies judge whether participants understand false beliefs by asking whether those participants can successfully predict the behavior of an agent who has one. To investigate this capacity in great apes, we exploited a novel nonverbal measure of an individual's predictions, their anticipatory looking. If I were reaching for a glass, many of you would look to the glass before I grasped it, anticipating the outcome of that event. What this means is that under controlled settings, your looking can therefore uh, be used as a measure of your predictions. And this is even true for great apes. We can, in some sense, see what they think is going to happen. So we tested a large sample of apes in Germany and Japan. As in Laura's social memory study, the apes sip juice and watch videos on a monitor while their gaze was non-invasively recorded and mapped onto those videos. For the most part, that looks like this, although sometimes a little reshuffling is in order. In classic verbal false belief tasks, 
Children witness an actor hide an object in one location. While she's away, the object is moved. When the actor returns, children are asked to predict where she will search for the hidden object. If participants understand that the actor has a false belief, they should predict that she'll search for the object where she left it, even though participants know that it's no longer there. In our studies, we've used uh, anticipatory looking as a nonverbal measure of such a prediction. And I will say this is sort of in the same vein of some work that um, your own colleague Clark Barrett has done with um, cross-cultural looking time studies. Um, so to succeed in this experiment, we had to think carefully about which kinds of videos would be meaningful and interesting to apes. Since uh, in their social life, they have to closely keep track of social conflicts, as I've shown you um, in this earlier work, we embedded false belief information in social dramas involving conflicts between a human and a character in a, a gorilla costume. These are the kinds of dramas that are just intrinsically really captivating to apes. They're equivalent of the Jersey Shore. Um, in the first experiment, the human actor was searching for the gorilla who had hidden in one of two hay bales. And in the second experiment, the actor was searching for a stone that the gorilla had hidden under one of two boxes. In the critical conditions, the human had watched the gorilla or the stone be hidden in one location. And while the human was away, it was moved. So when the human returned to the scene, he falsely believed that the gorilla or stone was still where he last saw it. We therefore wanted to know if apes would anticipate that he would search for it in that location. So during this period, when the human returns and approaches centrally toward those two locations, we measured whether apes looked first to the location accordant with the actor's false belief, or instead to the distractor location. These measures were all extracted automatically by the software based on predefined areas of interest. Of course, which location was correct was counterbalanced and each experiment included two different conditions that controlled for things like whether the target location was the first or last location where the object was hidden. All right, so here's an example of what one of the false belief condition test trials looked like in the second experiment. This chimpanzee um, is watching this video and these red dots show where she's looking. So the requisite drama. And then the actor watches the object, in this case, hidden on the left side. Here the gorilla moves the object and ultimately removes it. So now we have a situation where there's an agent outside of the room who falsely believes that the stone remains in this left location. And when the agent soon returns to the scene and uh, begins reaching ambiguously toward the two boxes, what we want to know is whether apes look to one location in anticipation of his search. Each ape participated in a single trial per experiment. So now I'll show you in red the number of apes who looked first at the target, um, the place the actor believed the object was hidden, and in blue, the number that looked first to the distractor. As you can see across both studies, uh, apes make the correct prediction. We then pooled the two data points from the subjects who participated in both experiments. Um, and this combined analysis further confirmed that in each of our conditions and overall, apes make the correct prediction. So across two experiments, apes correctly visually anticipated that an actor would search for an object where the actor had last seen that object, that is where he falsely believed it to be. By developing a novel and um, innovative approach and identifying the right motivational context that makes sense for these species, we were able to show for the first time that apes can pass a version of the false belief test. While I don't have time to go into this at length, I'll tell you that 
in the original study, we controlled for a number of lower level perceptual explanations and later even addressed a post hoc explanation that researchers studying human cognition have rarely taken on. And most excitingly, these results have been conceptually replicated in Japanese macaques. And in apes, we now have several other completed studies that extend this phenomenon and are starting to clarify its underlying mechanisms. Um, and I'll just share one of them with you today. So an open question from our first study is whether apes were likely to be tracking mental content, beliefs, or only behavior. One possibility from our previous work and pretty much all previous work on animal theory of mind was that maybe apes were just tracking something like the actor's orientation, the direction that the actor was facing, and expecting him to return to the location where he last oriented to the object. This sort of behavior reading hypothesis has long presented a challenge to animal theory of mind work because when we use our theory of mind, we extract information about mental states based on behavior. I know, for example, that you can see based on where you're oriented. But if an agent's behavior, such as the human actor in our study, provides enough information to solve the task, how can we know if participants are inferring anything additionally about the mental states behind that behavior? To control for this sort of behavior reading, Celia Hayes proposed that participants be tested in a novel situation that attempts to separate out an agent's behavior from her mental states. In Celia's proposed design, an agent's view is obscured by a novel blindfold, but participants can't know whether the blindfold, or they don't know whether the blindfold is opaque or see-through. So based on the behavior alone, we can't know whether um, this blindfolded individual can see. The only way that participants can determine whether the agent can see is by projecting their own recent mental experience of seeing or not seeing through that same blindfold. To accomplish this, we presented apes with the same storyline as before in another eye tracking task. Um, the actor watches the object be hidden in one location and then leaves. Um, the object is moved and the actor then returns to search for it. But instead of leaving through a door, the actor hides behind a novel barrier while the object is room removed. And critically, the key manipulation in this study occurred before apes watched the video. Half of them experienced the barrier in real life as opaque, um, just, and just as in our other studies, these apes anticipated that the actor would search for the object where it was before he went behind the barrier. That is, these apes treated the actor as though he had not seen the object moving and had a false belief about its location. The other half of the apes experienced the barrier in real life as see-through. And excitingly, these apes behaved significantly differently. They made no clear prediction looking equally to both locations. Consistent with the possibility that these apes thought the actor had already seen the object being removed. That is, even though all apes viewed the exact same video and the exact same behavior, they generated different predictions depending on their personal experience with the occlusive properties of the barrier. One important note is that this result derives from only one of two metrics that we used to measure anticipatory looking, which we can discuss later. That said, the study provides among the strongest evidence to date that apes may have projected their own mental experience of seeing or not seeing through the barrier onto the actor in order to predict his behavior. While we still have much work to do to understand how closely apes' social cognition approximates human theory of mind, these works are all consistent with the possibility that apes may be capable not only of richly tracking others' attention and behavior, but also of understanding, in some sense, when others have beliefs about the world that differ from their own. If we return to our phylogeny, we can see that some foundation of a sensitivity to others' beliefs is shared across hominoids, and perhaps uh, monkeys as well. 
Work that I've done with lemurs suggests that even our most distant primate relatives are sensitive to social cues like gaze direction, um, and that this capacity is likely foundational to primates. But lemurs do not seem to approximate the social cognitive insights of monkeys and apes. Although more research is needed in all of these species, the current picture raises two key points. First, different primates may experience the social world in uh, their social worlds in vastly different ways, depending on the social cognition they possess, even if they inhabit groups of similar sizes. And second, there's some evidence for an elaboration of social cognitive complexity throughout primate evolutionary history. The biggest takeaway that I'd like to offer from this part of the talk is that unique features of human cooperation and culture build on rich social cognitive foundations that we inherited from our common ancestors with chimpanzees and bonobos. As I've shown you today, ape social life is hugely complex. Chimpanzees and bonobos must do their best to keep track not only of their own relationships with their many groupmates, but also of the friendships, alliances, and rivalries that exist among those groupmates. They're also attempting to track, in some sense, the visual perspectives of their friends and rivals, even in situations where others' perspectives differ from their own. And they likely need to use all of that information, uh, sorry, all of that social cognition to make strategic decisions in their effort to build relationships, scale the dominance hierarchy, and reproduce. Okay, so now that we've attempted to reconstruct to some extent the cognitive phenotype of our Miocene common ancestors and to examine some of the cognitive abilities that shape social uh, complexity, let's turn briefly to this second task to understand how human and non-human ape social cognition evolved. As we discussed before, the social intelligence hypothesis argues that the most socially savvy individuals will be able to outcompete their groupmates for social success and reproductive opportunities. And as such, natural selection will always favor improved social cognition. Surprisingly, despite the widespread influence of this hypothesis, it's primarily been tested in interspecific comparisons, where some evidence suggests that species with larger social groups may also have larger brains. In this final set of studies, we aim to take a first step toward understanding intra-specifically whether variation in social cognition confers differential proximate or ultimate benefits in demanding social context. For these sorts of directions, I partner with Anne Pusey and Ian Gilby. Together we have access to 60 years of behavioral data on wild chimpanzees at Gombe National Park, Tanzania, the site established by Jane Goodall. We decided to investigate decision-making and adaptive benefits um, in intra-group intra competition. As I mentioned toward the beginning, chimpanzee societies are structured by dominance hierarchies with adult males occupying the top ranks and the highest ranking individuals enjoying the highest reproductive success. To build status, individuals must develop individualized social relationships. Grooming is one important relationship building activity. And here you see a chimpanzee communicating where he wants to be groomed. These social relationships can also translate into support in agonistic conflicts. Bystanders may intervene to support their friends in conflicts or they may develop coalitions to jointly attack more dominant individuals or to thwart lower ranking individuals attempting to usurp power. In past work, Ian Gilby and colleagues showed that wild male chimpanzees' engagement in coalitionary aggression is predictive of their likelihood of rising in rank and of siring offspring. And recently we added to this work by showing that social relationships can impact the reproductive success of wild male chimpanzees through multiple independent strategies. Males may achieve higher paternity success by befriending the highest ranking alpha male perhaps resulting in that male being more tolerant of matings by his allies, or males can cultivate a large network of strong social ties. These social ties are predictive of their involvement in coalitionary aggression, suggesting that many ties may provide the kind of social leverage males need to mate successfully. The key point from these last couple of slides is that 
Chimpanzees build social relationships, and these relationships meaningfully translate into further social success through rank acquisition, and also directly translate into reproductive success. What this means is that in the short and long term, apes living in diverse and varied networks of individuals must make decisions about whom to befriend, when to intervene in others' conflicts, how to build relationships and power, decisions that materially impact their everyday lives, as well as their evolutionary legacy. And coalitionary aggression in particular is an exemplar of the sort of within group competition where an animal's decisions may yield proximate and ultimate benefits as predicted by the social intelligence hypothesis. Inspired by the work of Joan Silk and your own Susan Perry, we decided to dive into this context to examine the decision-making strategies that chimpanzees may deploy. Unlike past work though, we additionally tested whether those strategies actually shape outcomes of conflict events. From the long-term Gombe data, we identified instances of dyadic conflicts between adult male chimpanzees in which one individual attempted to recruit support from a bystander. As an illustrative example of a single such event, you're minding your own business when all of a sudden you get attacked by a group mate. This is very scary, but fortunately you're not alone. There are many bystanders whom you can ask for help. These events happen over the course of seconds, so apes have to make rapid decisions about whom to solicit help from, and if they make a good decision, the bystander they target might intervene to support them, or the aggressor might get scared off by the risk of the conflict escalating. First, we ask what kind of information chimpanzees can marshal to make the most strategic decisions, to escape others' aggression in the short term and in the long term to build rank and relationships. At a course level, the decision maker can consider her knowledge of each individual bystander and the personal relationships she has with them. For example, she may preferentially seek help from her friends, or she can consider a more complex knowledge about the third party relationships she has historically observed between her aggressor and the various bystanders. Maybe she wants to avoid the aggressor's allies, for example. She may also apply more simple heuristics like choose the most dominant individual available. Using observational data, we couldn't directly look at cognition per se, but we were able to model these observations as, a decision, as decision making events in which chimpanzees could attempt to recruit any available bystander. As proxies for the types of social knowledge they might use, we quantified the decision maker's personal relationships with each bystander in terms of rank, kinship, grooming, and coalition frequencies. In case of decision makers also consulted third party knowledge, we additionally quantified the relationships between the aggressor and each bystander, um, as well as heuristics like choose the most dominant individual. In mixed models, we then examined which metrics of personal and third party relationship information predicted the decision maker's choice of recruit controlling for the other variables. Excitingly, we found that chimpanzees appear to make decisions based on a rich constellation of information. Predictably, they were more likely to solicit help from kin as well as frequent grooming and coalition partners. However, controlling for these effects, they were also more likely to select recruits who most greatly outrank their aggressor, consistent with attention to third-party knowledge. So aligning with the results of the controlled experiments I showed you earlier, in natural decision-making contexts, chimpanzees also appear to consider knowledge of both their own personal relationships with groupmates, as well as their groupmates' relationships with one another. In two further analyses, we asked whether any particular decision-making strategies yielded desirable outcomes. That is, whether social cognition might confer proximate benefits. First, we asked whether the recruit's relationship with the aggressor or with the decision-maker predicted whether the recruit actually intervened to support the decision-maker. Interestingly, although recruits intervened in roughly half of our events, no relationship metrics predicted whether they would do so. 
This was a bit surprising to us, but we reasoned that the threat of an intervention could be enough for aggressors to stand down. So next we asked whether the recruit's relationship with the aggressor or with the decision maker predicted whether aggression stopped following um, help, the help solicitation. And here, Excitingly, we found only one strategy that predicted termination of aggression. Chimpanzees were more likely to escape further aggression by attempting to recruit individuals who most outranked their aggressor, controlling for these various other relationship metrics or heuristic strategies. So a strategy potentially based on third-party knowledge was most successful at getting chimps out of a sticky situation. While future work must isolate controlled measures of individual cognitive variation and test their relationship to fitness outcomes, the study provides a first step in showing that social cognition may indeed confer adaptive benefits in competition. As the social intelligence hypothesis proposes, selection from the demands of group living may have driven the evolution of our social minds, at least through much of primate evolutionary history. To quickly summarize, what I've shown you today is that social knowledge and theory of mind have played a critical role in complicating the social lives of humans and other apes. Chimpanzees and bonobos recognize and remember numerous individuals for decades after last seeing them. They track novel information, novel third party information, and use it to make sensible social decisions. And they may even peer into others' minds, inferring. Uh, basic information about others' beliefs, all in the absence of language. Humans uh, may differ in their possession of certain unique cooperative and normative motivations and in some of the ways they represent others' minds. In the second half of the talk, I showed you that these same social cognitive abilities appear to shape apes' decision-making strategies in the wild and that consistent with the social intelligence hypothesis, more complex strategies may yield adaptive benefits. While there remains much to learn, what I hope has become clear today is that the roots of our social minds are discernible in the minds of our closest relatives, and that by continuing to examine these sorts of questions comparatively, we can get that much closer to figuring out who we are and how we came to be. With that, I'd like to acknowledge my mentors and to thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to answer questions. Thank you so much, Chris, for a fantastic talk, really cool findings um, and amazing methodology. Um, thanks for sharing all that with us. And there's a lot to digest there. Um, so I will, um, I will uh, curate the Q&A. And as a reminder to people, uh, use the raise hand option if you can under your participants bar. Um, our first two questions will be from Sasha and then Joe. Sasha, go for it. Hi, Chris. Um, thanks for a great talk. It's super, super interesting um, and a lot different research. Um, I was wanted to ask a question about the research you just presented actually on the interventions. Um, and I was wondering how this relates to or if you've thought about um, this literature about policer monkeys or policer individuals. I know in chimpanzees and in pigtail macaques and rhesus macaques, there's like often a few really high ranking, um, usually the high ranking males that act as like policers. So when they intervene in a conflict or even just I've seen like in macaques, the, if the alpha male approaches an ongoing conflict, it can stop the aggression. Um, so I was wondering like if part of the effect you found is, is driven by something like that, like maybe they're recruiting um, the, the highest ranking animals who are, who have this like policing function. And I mean, one of the mechanisms might just be that the aggressor is, is scared of them and stops, right? But um, I don't know if you've thought about that. Yeah, that's a cool question. So I guess one possibility would be that rather than tracking the third party rank relationship, they're just tracking some sort of disposition or identity that this is an individual who regularly um, interferes in, in conflicts or um, polices them. 
we haven't tried to quantify policing behavior specifically or sort of identify who are the specific policers. So I've just written down that that's something definitely worth looking into to see whether they tend to be the individuals who are solicited. Um, but what I can say is that we did sort of quantify within each um, help solicitation or recruitment event um, who was the highest ranking available option. And so I can say that this strategy specifically was not um, the one that predicted their choices or um, whether, um, whether the opponent stopped attacking or the aggressor stopped attacking them. Um, so I think policing individuals tend to be the highest ranking ones for sure. Um, and so if it were the case that um, they were just targeting those individuals, I would guess that that sort of heuristic might um, allow them to succeed. So you know, so the data are potentially consistent with them actually tracking this kind of third party rank information. But that being said, you know, this is all based on uh, behavioral observational work. And so, um, you know, we can't say it entirely for sure, um, but that is a great point and something worth exploring further. Cool, thanks. Great, thank you. Um, Jessica, we'll take a question from Joe Manson. Thanks, uh, great talk. Uh, my question is also about that last study. So, so the general problem that you're looking at is you said it's based on Joan Silk's work on macaques and the work that, that Susan and, and Clark and I did on capuchins. So both those species live in uh, cohesive groups whereas chimpanzees live in communities. And I wonder if that sort of poses, it complicates the computational problem in that an, an individual's knowledge of its different fellow community members varies because as a function of how often it's in the same traveling party with that individual. And I just wonder if there's any way to incorporate that into your analyses. Yeah, um, that's a good question. So I definitely think that the fission fusion dynamic makes things more complicated. I mean, on the one hand, you can choose who you spend time with, um, more directly, uh, but also you're absolutely right that you're missing a lot of what's going on with the rest of your group. Um, so this could be one reason why other metrics of third party relationship information didn't come out as meaningful predictors. Uh, maybe it's because rank is something that is consistent enough that everybody has a decent sense of it um, in even that third party information. But um, the, the nuanced knowledge that they have about grooming relationships um, might be less, um, yeah, less, less nuanced because they're missing part of that or they're missing some of the coalitionary aggression. Right now, the metrics that we've used are just based on all of the data that we have available. So are these individuals grooming regularly in general? Um, but it is true that um, perhaps in a future more complicated process, we could try to determine the grooming relationship that we think, you know, individual A has observed between B and C, for example, just based on the time that, you know, A was present in the group when B and C were grooming or something like that. So we would have to come up with individualized metrics for each individual, but um, that is something we could potentially do. Um, right. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Um, question from Josh. Hi, Josh. Uh, hey, uh, that was a wonderful talk. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit about the significance or interpreting the um, significance of the false belief studies. Um, and then I also had a, another question about the um, discussion of selection at the end. But the, the, the first question was just about the concept of belief that's in play in the studies. Um, so in the, some of the philosophical circles in which um, I fortunately or unfortunately run in, sometimes there's a tendency to associate belief with um, accepting something as true. Mm -hmm. um, and so having a kind of semantic commitment regarding um, the attitude. And so there'll be a, a distinction made between the, the kind of commitment the agent's making and reserving the term belief for something involving um, the agent forming um, 
as it were, using the description of truth in the evaluation of the circumstance. Um, and then relatedly in slightly more formal context, you know, you might use belief to be um, in a kind of Bayesian mode, something that satisfies the axiom, the, the axiom to the probability calculus. And then you reserve the term belief for something that has a sufficiently high credence of the agent. And so that would be another way that to kind of think about something concrete that is involving with belief that's more than just kind of uh, accepting for the purposes of guiding action. Um, and so does, does the distinctions between notions of belief matter um, to you? Or could you just say a little bit more about the notion of belief that you think um, is at work in the, in the chimps or in the bonobos that? Um, sure. Yeah, so this is a great question. I think, you know, now that we have this kind of phenomenon, then we can try and dig deeper into what it actually means and um, what kinds of mechanisms are at play. So um, Mike Tomasello and, um, and uh, Vicky Southgate have made arguments, for example, that... Um, well, Mike Tomasello's idea is that, like, as children, human children develop and engage in um, cooperative shared intentional frameworks where they are thinking about others' perspectives and contrasting them, um, they sort of come to have an understanding of objectivity and truth and that this sort of proper real conception of belief and false belief is something that emerges in children later in life, even though infants are already showing some success in these kinds of tasks. Um, and so, you know, one possibility from you know, those ideas and, and the infant literature is that, um, yeah, that, that, that the, the concepts of, of truth are not necessarily involved in these kinds of representations of others' beliefs. This might be just a sort of basic tracking of the kind of latest information that the individual has without any evaluation of um, how it relates to the objective reality or without any relation to, um, you know, whether the, or uh, any evaluation of, of um, whether the agent believes that it is true. Um, it's, yeah, so I think when I use the term belief, I'm using it kind of in the simplest possible sense as like encoding some kind of um, perspective on an object. And um, these additional components may or may not be um, part of the equation. These are things that I think require additional research. But um, some of the ideas, for example, with that, what Vicky Southgate have, have put forward is that when infants pass these sorts of tasks, they might just be adopting the other individual's perspective in a way that kind of suppresses their own. And so there isn't really, this is just kind of how they understand the world, but any um, understanding of, um, of objectivity or truth or beliefs about truth are, um, are just kind of intrinsic to the extent that they exist. Um, Good. That's, um... It's really helpful. I mean, there's still a basic kind of decoupling, I think, that the studies may reveal. And you may think that's a really interesting and novel kind of ability to engage in a kind of decoupled um, form of social cognition that you're allowing your own appearances to be different from the appearances of some other agent. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask about, I, I wanted to take up too much time, but um, on the selection, um, I mean, do you have any thoughts about the features that um, in the last six or eight million years um, have selected for the differences between humans and other li um, living primates vis-a-vis -vis theory of mind. Um, so, I mean, if you agree that there's selection pressure already in chimps to engage in some form of kind of um, factive or, or basic uh, theory of mind, um, yeah, did you have any specific ideas about what would trigger the, you know, the subsequent divergences that we see at work? Uh, yeah. Well, I don't have a strong commitment to uh, what I'm about to say. So I'll just sort of, I guess, some of the ideas that um, 
you know, that others have put forward are that various sort of cooperative um, situations have pr presented an important selective pressure first for, uh, I mean, Mike Tomasello's idea, for example, which sort of aligns with things that other people have said as well, um, you know, is having to do with initially needing to cooperate um, in, for example, large-scale hunting practices and ultimately then cooperating um, within one's group against other groups. This is, of course, an idea that, um, that others like um, Boyd and Richardson and, and others have talked about too. So, I mean, one possibility is that that sort of increasingly the, the demands for um, cooperation, which in some sense could be also an extension of this kind of social intelligence hypothesis, but um, to a different human specific activities that, um, that sort of seeded more pro-social motivations and um, more, I mean, if Mike is right, then it, a lot of it really comes down to um, this kind of shared intentionality, this ability to create a sort of shared intentional framework um, in which we're jointly aware of each other's perspectives and coordinating toward um, shared goals. So this is uh, just one possibility, but um, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to hear other thoughts about this as well. And it's, I can't say that I, at this point, have a strong commitment. I think we have more work to do to try and figure out what exactly the boundaries are. And so hopefully that will help clarify um, the selective pressures as well. Okay. Thanks so much. Great, thanks. Um, next, um, a question from Erica. Hi, Erica. Hi, uh, thanks, Chris. Super, super interesting work. Um, so I, um, I have a couple of questions. I, I'll just um, ask, I think I'll just ask one. Well, ask a cluster. <laughs> Um, I, I guess I'm very intrigued by the finding of, I think it's the second study you presented about the um, helpers and hinderers and the bonobos, um, and the finding that bonobos prefer hinderers over helpers, um, and then dominant individuals. Uh, more generally, uh, I just think is so surprising. I mean, given the kind of, you know, popular conception of bonobos, you know, more or less egalitarian nature, right? They don't, they're not the strict dominance hierarchy. They're not supposed to, you know, they're not quote unquote supposed to um, be as sensitive to, to dominance. And, and so I love that your findings kind of fly in the face of that and make us think more in a more nuanced way about um, our characterization of the species. So I just wanted to kind of push you a little bit or probe, I don't know, a little bit to, to hear some more of your thoughts on why you thought um, they had this dominance bias. Is it prestige? You know, are they, see, are they I guess, a more um, sort of in line with their egalitarian reputation? You know, are they seeking information about individuals who behave in unexpected ways? Mm -hmm. um, are they more attuned to dominance than our, you know, their reputation would suggest? Um, and I guess as a sort of comparison point, have you done the, um, the dominance test outside of the helping hindering paradigm with chimpanzees? And if so, do they also prefer? Because I think that's such an interesting point where the chimps prefer the helpers and the bonobos prefer the hinderers. And that really is the reverse of, of what you expect from those species in, in other experiments. Yeah. Okay, great. This is lots of good things to unpack. Um, thank you. Um, okay, so where do I start? I think, so you could interpret, for example, the, the first helping and hindering study based on these animations where, um, so in those cases, the bonobos are choosing between paper cutouts of the helper and hinderer. And what I didn't mention is that those paper cutouts are each placed on a small piece of food to motivate them to make a choice in the first place. And so that's a case where you could make a claim, well, actually they're choosing the helper because they just want to take food away from the bad guy. So obviously this is like an extremely rich interpretation, but you could say something like that, right? But I think it's not really consistent with the findings from the latter studies where, um, you know, 
why would you then approach um, an individual who's giving you food, who is sort of the bad guy, if if you're trying to deprive them of food? So I think, you know, we're seeing this like genuine affinity for these kinds of characters. Um, I do think, I mean, one thing I will say is that dominance obviously matters for most social animals, and that's certainly true for bonobos. Um, and so in that sense, this wouldn't be so surprising if it's also true that, you know, we see these kinds of preferences in other species like gems, and I'll circle back to that in a minute. But, but I also think it's true that bonobos have to some extent been mischaracterized. Um, they are meaningfully different from chimpanzees in a number of ways. And certainly when it comes to intergroup relations, the kind of tolerance that we see there, it's not to say that it's a party, right? Like when, when two groups meet initially, um, males will hang back on both sides and it seems to be stressful for them and females are much more motivated to engage, but ultimately they can be in the same tree with multiple other groups and that's been observed at Wamba. So this is strikingly different from chimps, which are terrified of outgroup individuals and, and routinely kill each other. So I think in this sense, there is like a meaningful difference in social tolerance, but that being said, um, bonobos can also be jerks to each other and that's very evident in the populations that I have um, worked with and so in that sense I think like the the relevance of dominance uh, makes sense and you know in the wild as well you see so um, Shinya Yamamoto has a study where he looked at these big um, fruiting trees with bonobos in the trees and there's an abundance of food so we don't I don't need your help to get it, but um, he finds that the bonobos are then begging for food from more dominant individuals, potentially as a way to test their relationship um, with those individuals. So we do see sort of across different contexts that dominance seems to matter for them. Um, yeah, of course, it is also an interesting question whether they um, are able to keep track of other things like prestige or if that's if that's an entirely distinct status system that is unique to humans or whatnot. But one thing I'll say about the chimp data is that we haven't done this exact experiment with chimps and there is some data on their preference for helpers or hinderers, but um, those are always cases where they saw a helper deliver food and a hinderer steal food. And then they had the choice to approach one of those individuals um, who had, both of whom had food. So they might in those cases, and they the chimps did show a preference in those cases to interact with the so-called helper, but it could just be that they have observed this individual gives food, I want to get food. In our cases, we, we tried to sort of dissociate these things so that the helping and hindering were demonstrated in a context that was separate from the food transfer. So we hope that that would be more of a sort of genuine demonstration of their preference for helping, hindering, or dominance, but um, but it would be great to do these exact experiments to understand whether chimps are, um, you know, the more cooperative species or um, bonobos and chimps are showing kind of similar tendencies in this respect, and, and it's humans who are different in, in preferring the helpers from an early age. Thanks, Erica. Did you have more to your question, Erica, or was that all of the multi-parts? That, that was enough parts for, for today, but thank you. <laughs> okay. All right, let's take a question from Dan. So um, I was thinking along similar lines, and um, I'm, you know, your, your answers to Erica's query um, uh, in some ways address some of my speculation, shall we say, but in some ways do not, right? Uh, and, and if we zoom way back, and I know that when, when, what, when one is enmeshed in the details of a research enterprise, it's sometimes hard to have perspective on the whole thing. But if we zoom way back, right, the, that the, the, there, is, there is cultural inertia in methodology and in the interpretation of methods, right? So these methods that you're employing were originally developed for use in, in children, right? And, and children are subordinate period, right? Especially very young children. Um, uh, so 
from the child's perspective, any of these agents, whether they're puppets, you know, uh, paper cutouts or humans, you're pretty much subordinate to everyone. There, there, there really isn't, you know, <laughs> there aren't other options, but that's not the case. And I'm not by any means defending a Rousseauian vision of bonobos. I'm glad that you're, you know, helping to dispel some of these, you know, um, idealistic visions that some people have, right? Um, uh, but, um, you know, bonobos are big, powerful animals, okay? Little paper cutouts don't pose any threat to them. And even potentially human experimenters don't really pose any threat to them, okay? So um, I find the, the natural observations that you describe begging from dominant individuals much more compelling than um, that the individual will approach the hinderer, whether the hinderer is a paper cutout or a human being, because um, frankly, it's not at all clear that that any experimental animal in these you know designs that you've described is subordinate to any of the individuals with whom you know they're they're potentially choosing among. Right? That's it. Okay. Um... Yeah, that's a so that's an, an interesting point. I one thing I will say is that from still a pretty early age. Okay, wait. There's two points. Um, okay, one one thing I can say is on the side of the human data, um, it's still within I think the first or second year of life that infants also prefer hinderers who hinder hinderers. Um, so we do see these kinds of opposite preferences, even uh, as uh, subordinate individuals, as um, babies, basically. Um, right, j j just to clarify, I, I'm not, I am entirely on board with the conventional interpretation of the human results, right? My point is that when we interpret that frame of meaning into the chimp work, um, there are other considerations that the, that the experimental individuals, the subjects in the experiment are, are large, powerful animals, not little babies, right? Right. Yeah. So, um, can you, sorry, can you recap the second half of your question? Right, or your right. Point? So, uh. so, so uh, I, I am... I am. I subscribe entirely to the interpretation of the human results that the humans mm -hmm. have moral preferences, as it were, right, and including higher order punishment preferences, right. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the somewhat deflationary interpretation of the bonobo results, for example, is not that they have a preference for a hinderer, right. So much as it is that they are not intimidated. That is, you interpreted that result as a preference for a dominant individual. Right. And, and my point is, it's not at all clear that from the perspective of the experimental subject in the bonobo work, that is a dominant individual. They might be right. dominant to the other individuals within the frame of the, of the story, but they're not dominant to the subject. Right, sure. Yeah, that's true. I think um, we don't necessarily know... Um, uh, yeah, I think this is a good point. I mean, our interpretation is partly based on the alignment of these results with what we observe in the wild. But I think the point you raise is, is an important one. And certainly, you know, something I didn't point out, but is that the findings that we have are specifically from adult bonobos. So if you look at adolescents and juveniles, we don't see a consistent preference there. So one possibility is that, um, you know, individuals who are, who potentially could be subordinate to these human actors um, in the, in those cases. So the, probably they're not subordinate to paper, but um, to the human actors, um, those individuals are not motivated to show the same preference. So it could potentially be that, um, that their own standing is, is really relevant to the effects that we see here. I can't say for sure. Yeah, if anything, I would say that adds evidence for the deflationary account in this regard, because if, you know, the, the, the more subordinate the individual is in the hierarchy, if their strategy is curry favor with dominance, the more they should evince that strategy. So juveniles should show it in spades relative to adults. And if the reverse is true, 
that cast doubt on that interpretation. Right? Yeah, I mean, it's complicated with the juveniles and because they're um, not engaging in the same way with the dominance hierarchy. And so I think it also, from the other perspective, makes sense that individuals who are interacting, who are sort of entering the dominance hierarchy or who are in it are the ones that are more motivated to take into account this kind of information. So that's, I think, also a possibility. But, but for sure, I think um, at this point, we can't distinguish these possibilities. And as I mentioned, our interpretation is kind of depending on or trying to account for the, the behavior in, in natural circumstances as well. Um, but I guess, for me, the, the biggest takeaway is that they're able to pay attention to these third party interactions and make decisions on the basis of them. These are captive individuals and um, you know, the motivations that, that might determine uh, preferences could potentially um, vary across different contexts or different lived experiences. So I don't wanna make a very strong um, claim about, um, about that. Thanks. Just a quick follow up on that. Is it is it safe to say that we don't fully understand why babies or non human primates would reach out and grasp one of these objects anyway? Or is that is that well understood? I mean, I've never quite got that. It seems like a sort of fortunate accident almost that they exhibit that through preferences. But like why they're reaching for these things to hold them doesn't seem totally clear from a sort of ecological perspective. You mean like whether that reflects a preference or why they do it in the first place? Right, because I mean, the, the, the gaze direction, you know, the eye tracking stuff makes sense because it's what you do in the real world. You, you look at things that are interesting, right? So there's an information gathering um, aspect to it or whatever, but like reaching out to grab a thing that's the same shape as a social agent that you saw doing something is, is not mm -hmm. a natural behavior, right? And so, um, you know, it's an interesting question, like why do primates do this? Um, yeah, I mean, this is a good question. So in the infant literature, there's, um, you know, various sort of convergent methods that, um, you know, looking preferences also are linked to reaching preferences and once verbal um, abilities come on to these sort of verbal preferences too. And so we're kind of, you know, feeding into this literature where that is the interpretation. And I think um, particularly because we find these consistent effects across also the more naturalistic cases where they're interacting with real unfamiliar human partners, um, you know, I think for us, it, it makes sense to, yeah. to have this consistent interpretation, but, but that's true that this is, um, you know, it's a, it's a yeah, no, I mean, that, that seems reasonable to me too. I mean, I, 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 that, that there's all convergence there. It's just, you know, it's funny because in, in some way it wouldn't, it doesn't have to be that way, right? You could easily right. have had a case where they watch these scenarios and then they're like, oh, that just happened. Mm -hmm. They don't necessarily have to like reach for the thing, right? But yeah. The fact that they do I mean, is interesting. I guess one, one point from the infant literature is that it seems to be... Mm, the earliest emerging phenomenon is an aversion to the hinderers even more than uh, an attraction to the helpers. So this may be some sort of motivating dimension of that process that like you stay away from the bad guy and, um, but you know, children are otherwise exploring their environment and. Um, yeah. yeah, it makes sense. Um, Sasha has a, another question. Sasha. Yeah, sorry, I know I already asked a question. No, it's okay. As long as no one else has one. Um, I wanted to ask a just general question about the false belief stuff. So sorry, we're also jumping around all the different areas of your research. But um, my question was just like generally what you think about, I, I guess, so it seems like apes can pass these implicit eye tracking tests, um, but like similar to how infants can pass the eye tracking, but they can't pass the explicit test. It seems like apes can't pass like an explicit test of, of false belief, right? Like where they have to choose a um, choose an option. 
And I, I, yeah, I guess I was wondering, like, do you think that your test is just a better design and that they could have explicit false belief tracking? And those like previous studies were just like poorly designed for chimpanzees motivation or whatever. Or is it something like, kind of like the change from, from infant to whatever, four or five year old development where they, the children go from having different types of, or differently levels of false belief understanding? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I think there are some potentially meaningful differences with our task in the sense that one, we've sort of minimized the cognitive and behavioral demands as much as possible. All they have to do is watch and you know, hopefully they're motivated enough to pay attention to, and to generate um, predictions. And we've also removed some of the distracting elements. So these tasks are not centered around food, um, which might lead to inhibitory control problems, um, but instead are um, you know, just based around sort of social dynamics. Um, but it's also true that the rest of the ape false belief literature is a little more ambiguous than it's historically been viewed, I think. So more recently, there is one study using a sort of helping task um, by David Bottleman and colleagues where um, there's a scenario where um, a desirable object is hidden in one location and, um, and then either the actor remains present or leaves the room and it's moved to the other location. And so then the actor um, in both cases returns and tries to open the empty box. And the idea here is if, if apes understand that the actor has a true versus false belief, um, they should behave differently in those situations. So if they know that the actor has a false belief and actually wants you know, the object, they should open the other box where the object is now located. Whereas if they recognize that the actor has a true belief and must now have a different motivation, they should um, just open the box that the actor wants to have open. And um, in this task, apes correctly respond correctly in the false belief condition, opening the other box and they do so more than in the true belief condition, although their responses are um, kind of at chance in the true belief condition. Um, so this is sort of one behavioral evidence that is not, um, doesn't necessarily isolate the mechanism, but is consistent with the possibility of acting on some kind of representation of belief. Um, and then some of the other uh, behavioral studies, which I think are actually, many of them are, you know, brilliantly designed and particularly for the, for what we knew at the time, um, they, they show positive responses, um, positive evidence in false belief conditions, but there are various controls where apes perform similarly. So it's hard to tell on those tasks, whether apes are tracking something like others' ignorance or whether they're really understanding others' beliefs. But for example, in the famous Kaminsky um, chimp chess study, bonobos perform correctly in the false belief condition. It's just that they perform similarly in a, in a, in a sort of, in a control condition, which kind of muddies the interpretation of those data. Um, so, and Brian Hare's um, 2001 paper also is, provides some evidence that it's, it's not well powered, but it's kind of consistent with success in a misinformed um, false belief context, but the behavior there is also kind of the same as in a similar ignorance context. And so it's impossible to tell whether apes are just tracking something related to ignorance or whether they're tracking something more sophisticated related to belief in those contexts. Um, so yeah, just to, so I think it's, it's still, we don't really know exactly. Um, I would expect though, that if they really get this kind of stuff that they should be able to act on it in some contexts. Um, so, yeah. Cool. Thanks. Great, thank you. Um, we have time for one more question. Nadia, would you like to ask? Question? Uh, yes. Uh, hi, Chris. Good to see you. Thank you for uh, a great, interesting talk. Uh, I have a naive question about uh, 
Bonobo's preference for dominant individuals, and it ignores all this uh, sophisticated caveats that Dan and uh, Erica raised. Um, so I'm just curious whether dominance means the same thing in uh, chimp society and in a bonobo society. And I'm just going off based on what you said about it possibly being more egalitarian. It just seems like in a generally more egalitarian society, dominant individuals are kind of less scary. So I'm just thinking intuitively in a human society, comparing it like a democratically elected leader or in a uh, totalitarian society, a dictator, like both are in a position of dominance, but because one society is generally more egalitarian, the, then it's more like, uh, you know, this person has an authority to set rules and yes, uh, they can boss us all around, but it's not scary in the same way. It's kind of like they have the prestige and power, but they are not necessarily a jerk. Is there anything, uh, <laughs> could this apply to these two uh, societies and would that would that help understand the results? Yeah, that's that's really a terrific thought. Um, I think it would be really uh, revealing to have comparative data with chimpanzees to see whether they're doing the same thing or something different, um, as there are sort of meaningful differences between their societies. But um, bonobos are dicks to each other sometimes, and um, they uh you know they're i think females are often sort of they form coalitions to thwart male efforts at aggression um but they also attempt to suppress males and suppress each other kind of opportunistically and so you know there there is this sort of pervasive dimension of cooperation that exists there but you know it's also in the context of competition and dominance. So I, I don't think that um, there is the same, mm, I don't think that it's entirely an egalitarian society in the way that we might think of more egalitarian human societies, but, but certainly there are many open questions about exactly which kinds of information are motivating their choices. And we could certainly try to do various follow-ups that um, pinpoint or present like dominance in different ways that might be more aligned with things like prestige or, um, you know, other, other motivations for their preferences. And I think, yeah, there's definitely cool work to potentially be done there. Um, so thank you for those suggestions. Thank you. Great, thanks so much. Um, so I think that brings us to the end of our uh, time for Q&A. Um, I want to uh, thank Chris again for a, a wonderful talk and really interesting conversation in the question and answer. Um, if others want to unmute yourselves for a second, um, let's, uh, let's thank Chris. Thanks so much for having me, it's been yeah. a pleasure. Fantastic. And um, I will see everyone on Monday for Alyssa Crittenden's talk on microbiomania. Um, thank you all. And I'll see you next week. Let me stop the recording.